I recently debated an annihilationist. The topic of the debate was, did God save the whole world? A link to that debate is in the description of this video down below. Following is my opening presentation from that debate showing the scriptural evidence that reveals, yes, God did save the whole world through Jesus' death and resurrection 2,000 years ago. And that includes you, and that includes me, and the whole world. God saved the world through Jesus, and God is happy. He's not mad at the world. Romans 5.10 Being enemies, we were conciliated to God through the death of His Son. He's at peace with the world because His Son's death accomplished its purpose, the salvation of the world. I hope you will realize the depth of God's and Jesus' love, grace, mercy, power, and their effectiveness for you and the whole world. For nearly 4,000 years, the world was under death, sin, and condemnation because of one act of disobedience by our forefather, Adam the gardener. 2,000 years ago, God did something to undo all the death, sin, and condemnation in the world. He sent his son, aka the last Adam, the savior of the world. Jesus told us in Luke 19.10, For the Son of Mankind came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus came to seek and to save what Adam lost, all of it. The word lost is from the Greek word apolemi, which means lost, destroyed, or perished. The lost, destroyed, and perished, which includes all of us, are the very ones Jesus came to seek and to save and did save. Jesus saved you 2,000 years ago. The salvation of the world has been secured by the Savior of the world. Yes, there will be judgment and correction until God's plan is fully accomplished. But here's some great news. The judge of the world is also the Savior of the world, and his saving of the world precedes his work of judging. And more great news. Hebrews 6.2 reveals that the effect of the judging is not eternal or everlasting. It is judgment eonian. It has a beginning and an end and is for a limited duration. And all judgment has a great purpose beyond the judgment. John 5, 22 through 23. For neither is the Father judging anyone, but has given all judging to the Son, that all may be honoring the Son according as they are honoring the Father. Because he will be an effective judge, Jesus' future judging will lead all to honor him, which will include all believing in him. This includes all who die in the womb, all who die young, all who didn't hear about Jesus in this life, and all who didn't believe in him in this life. And the result of all honoring him will bring great glory to the Father, as we see in Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Wherefore also God highly exalts Jesus, and graces him with the name that is above every name, that in the name of Jesus every knee should be bowing, celestial and terrestrial and subterranean, and every tongue should be acclaiming that Christ Jesus is Lord for the glory of God the Father. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by Holy Spirit. The God of the scriptures desires all to be saved. Not only that, he wills all to be saved because he loves the world, even his enemies. 1 Timothy 2.4 Our Savior God wills that all mankind be saved and come into a realization of the truth. We know God wills all mankind to be saved because he did something about it. He sent his Son. God is operating all in accord with the counsel of his will. The Son of God declared in Hebrews 10.9, Lo, I am arriving to do thy will, O God. And we see confirmation of this in 1 Timothy 1.15. Faithful is the saying and worthy of all welcome that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, foremost of whom am I. If you're a sinner, Jesus came to save you, and he did save you. Jesus saved the foremost sinner, the nasty Pharisee Saul, who became the Apostle Paul. By saving the foremost sinner, God revealed the magnitude of his overwhelming grace for all sinners. Be encouraged. Where sin increases, grace super exceeds. No one will be tormented forever or be dead forever thanks to the work of God through Christ. All of us will be with all of our loved ones forever, whether they believe in Jesus in this life or not. The safety net securing the world's salvation has been set in place by God through Jesus' death and resurrection. Therefore, the living God is the Savior of all mankind, especially of believers. We must understand this very important fact about the Almighty God. He states very boldly in Isaiah 46.10, All my desire shall I do. 
God's desire for all to be saved will be done. He sent the successful Savior for a world lost in death, sin, and condemnation. Jesus lived among us, taught us, and died for all of us. 1 Timothy 2.6 tells us Christ Jesus is giving himself a correspondent ransom for all, the testimony in its own eras. Jesus told his Father in John 17.4, I glorify thee on the earth, finishing the work which thou hast given me, that I should be doing it. And he proclaimed from the cross in tremendous agony, it is finished. What did he finish? He finished his mission. He saved the world. His one act of obedience accomplished far more than most of us have been told. His one act secured the glorious future for all of us that we see in Romans 11:36. Out of him and through him and into him is all. We all came out of God, and we will all return into him, alive and well. For God is he not of the dead, but of the living, for all to him are living. At the consummation of the eons, after Jesus abolishes death, and no one is dead, God will be all in all. There are three aspects of salvation, past, present, and future. Understanding these three aspects is critical. God works through Christ to complete all three aspects of salvation for every one of us with zero help from us. Aspect 1, Salvation Past. This was completed at the cross and is the hard part of salvation. The hard part is accomplished. It is finished. This one event procured the salvation of the whole world. This is why Paul could tell the Ephesians the good news of your salvation before they believed. The past work of salvation annulled the acts of the adversary. The blood of his cross secured peace and reconciliation for every creature. We were all saved 2,000 years ago. This aspect of salvation precedes judgment. Aspect 2, present salvation. This is ongoing salvation affecting the believer personally. It begins the moment God grants belief to the unbeliever. God grants the unbeliever belief in the four foundational facts regarding the finished work of God and Christ that saved the world. 1. Christ died. 2. Christ died for our sins. 3. Christ was entombed. 4. Christ was saved out of death by his Father the third day. This aspect of salvation occurs at different times for different people. The elect will be given belief in this life. The non-elect will be given belief at the great white throne judgment when Jesus' successful judging will cause all to honor him, which will include all believing in him. Aspect 3, future salvation. This is our deliverance when our salvation will be fully realized and experienced. We will be vivified, which is being made immortal and incorruptible. We will be filled with spirit and constituted just by God. This aspect of salvation occurs earlier for the elect at the consummation of this present wicked eon in Christ's presence. They will have eonian life for the remaining oncoming eons, which are both good. It occurs for the rest later at the consummation of the eons when death is fully abolished and God is all in all. My purpose in this video is to show that aspect one of salvation, salvation past, has been successfully accomplished by God through his son's death and resurrection. Aspects two and three of salvation are based upon God's and Christ's past completed work. God began the work for our salvation and he will finish it. Jesus' death and resurrection is God's promise that he will complete the good work he began for us all. Before we look at Christ's successful work in salvation past, we need to understand what happened through our forefather, the first Adam, the gardener. God put the whole world into a bad situation. He did this by placing Adam, Eve, the serpent, and the desirable forbidden tree together into an explosive situation in the garden. It ended very badly. Death. The adversary's lie that deceived Eve led to Adam's one offense in the garden. That one offense brought the whole world into condemnation. Adam's one transgression brought death into all mankind. Romans 5.12 Therefore, even as through one man sin entered into the world, and through sin death, and thus death passed through into all mankind, on which all sinned. We are all dying because of Adam's one sin. Paul expands on this bad situation a little later in the same chapter. Romans 5, 18a and 19a in the red. Verse 18. So then, as through one offense, the result was condemnation to all mankind. Verse 19. For even as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were constituted sinners. Our death and condemnation were secured about 6,000 years ago, and because death passed into all, the many, in verse 19, were constituted sinners. The many is all sinners after Adam, who was the initial sinner. The sinless Christ is also not included in the many who were constituted sinners. And this is all God's doing. 
doing. It's not fair that all mankind was condemned because of Adam's one offense. I didn't give God permission to condemn me with Adam. I didn't accept Adam as my personal condemner. None of us did. At conception in the womb, which is an act of God, everyone comes under death and condemnation because of their relation to Adam. Those who come out of the womb alive will eventually begin to sin. When one is given belief in Christ, which is also an act of God, one enters aspect two of his salvation. He is sealed with an earnest of the Spirit, given a realization of the truth, and begins to enjoy the beneficial results of Christ's death and resurrection. Now for some great news, let's look at the rest of Romans 5, 18-19 in the green. Verse 18, So also, through one act of righteousness, the result was justification of life to all mankind. Verse 19, Thus also, through the obedience of the one, the many shall be constituted just. The scope of Christ's good work is revealed to us by its direct comparison to the scope of Adam's bad work. Death, sin, and condemnation entered the whole world through one act of one man. Death, sin, and condemnation will be removed from the whole world because of one act of one man. The many in verse 19 is all except Christ, who is just. Some have said God can't save all because he is just. Well, look at that. We'll all be constituted just because of the obedience of our Savior. God is justifying the irreverent. We're not able to stop the disastrous results of Adam's one offense. Likewise, we're not able to stop the glorious results of Christ's one obedience. Who would want to? Remember, where sin increases, grace super exceeds. Just as God unfairly includes all of us in Adam and the bad results of his disobedience, he unfairly includes all of us sinners in Christ and the great results of his obedience. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. For even as in Adam all are dying, thus also in Christ shall all be vivified. Again, we see the scope of the results of Christ's one act by its direct comparison to the scope of the results of Adam's one act. In Adam all are dying, thus also in Christ shall all be vivified, which is being made immortal and incorruptible like Christ. Let's now look at Jesus' first completed mission in which God secured the salvation of the world through his son's death and resurrection 2,000 years ago. God sent his son to save the world, including the non-elect, those who aren't granted belief in Jesus in this life. John 12, 46-48 I have come into the world a light, that everyone who is believing in me should not be remaining in darkness. And if ever anyone should be hearing my declarations and not be maintaining them, I am not judging him. For I came not that I should be judging the world, but that I should be saving the world. He who is repudiating me and not getting my declarations has that which is judging him. The word which I speak, that will be judging him in the last day. In this passage, we see a key to understanding God's salvation and judgment of the world. Salvation by Christ precedes judgment by Christ. Remember, the judge of the world is also the savior of the world. He saved the world during the death phase of his mission. He will be judging later at the great white throne. In verse 47, Jesus said the one hearing his declarations and not maintaining them is not being judged. Why? Because Jesus said, For I came not that I should be judging the world, but that I should be saving the world. In saying this, Jesus includes the repudiator with the world that he came to save and did save. In reality, this includes billions of Christ repudiators who have no place in their lives for Jesus. All of them have been saved with the world. The fact that the repudiator will be judged later reveals he was not granted belief in in this life because those who believe in this life, the elect, will have Eonian life and do not come into judging. The past completed salvation that Jesus secured is a safety net for the world. No matter what judgment follows, even if it's the second death in the lake of fire, the judged person has already been saved. Salvation precedes judgment. Remember, the effect of judgment is Eonian, not eternal or everlasting. Jesus' future judging of those who repudiate him will not undo the salvation he has already secured for them by his death. Christ will not undo his own work. The truth of John 12 is reinforced in John 3.17. For God does not dispatch his Son into the world that he should be judging the world, but that the world may be saved through him. The world Jesus was sent to save is the same world he would have judged if the first phase of his work was the judging of the world. 
When we see these two verses together, we notice in John 12, 47, Jesus' saving of the world is active, but in John 3, 17, the world being saved is passive. This is another essential key to understanding our salvation. We must maintain this distinction. Jesus actively saves, the world is passively saved. It plays no active part in its own salvation. God and Christ have to be active in the salvation of the world because we are told in Romans 3, 11 through 12, not one is seeking out God all avoid him. This is due to God locking up all in stubbornness. Romans 11:32. For God locks up all together in stubbornness that he should be merciful to all. In God's time, he releases each of us from the prison of stubbornness when he is merciful to each, even while we are sinners and in ignorance and unbelief, not deserving his mercy. And we see more evidence that reveals the scope of Christ's completed work, which includes those who believe in this life and those who don't. 1 John 2.2 2, And he is the propitiatory shelter concerned with our sins, yet not concerned with ours only, but concerned with the whole world also. 1 John 5.19 We are aware that we are of God and the whole world is lying in the wicked one. The whole world that is lying in the wicked one is the same whole world whose sins have been covered by Jesus. 1 John 4.14 And we have gazed upon him and are testifying that the Father has dispatched the Son, the Savior of the world. Would God call his son savior of the world if he didn't actually save the world? No, that's just empty boasting which God doesn't need to do. The son is the savior of the world, the whole world. And Jesus actively accomplished our salvation by taking away the sin of the world. John 1, 29, John the Baptist is observing Jesus coming toward him and is saying, Lo, the Lamb of God which is taking away the sin of the world. When Jesus took away the sin of the world, this included the sin of the non-elect repudiators we saw in John 12, and even the falsely named unforgivable sin. He took away all sin. And how did he do this? How did Christ take away the sin of the world, including my sin and your sin? 1 Peter 2:24. He carries up our sins in his body onto the pole. He didn't just carry Israel's sins or the sins of the elect in his body. God placed all sin, past and future, into the body of our Savior. He was made sin, and he died, and sin was condemned. Romans 8, 3. For what was impossible to the law in which it was infirmed through the flesh did God, sending his own Son in the likeness of sin's flesh, and concerning sin, he condemns sin in the flesh. It's through the death of Christ that the sin of the world has been taken away and condemned. The old humanity that was in Adam was crucified together with him. Sin, death, condemnation, and the adversary have all been dealt with through the death of Christ. Hebrews 2.14 Through death, Christ should be discarding him who has the might of death, that is, the adversary. 1 John 3.8 For this was the Son of God manifested, that he should be annulling the acts of the adversary. And we know the entire sin of the world, past and future, has been taken away because God is now conciliated to the world. 2 Corinthians 5.19 God was in Christ, conciliating the world to himself, not reckoning their offenses to them. God is happy. God is now at peace with the world, not reckoning their offenses to them. But most of the world is not at peace with him because they don't yet know him or believe in him. Believe in God and Christ. Be conciliated to God. Jesus' death for all was for the benefit of all. 2 Corinthians 5.14 For the love of Christ is constraining us, judging this, that if one died for the sake of all, consequently all died. He died for the sake of all, which is for the benefit of all. He died for the sake of the irreverent. All will benefit from his death. None of Christ's suffering and shed blood for the benefit of all will be wasted. He will be richly and fully rewarded with all that his blood bought, even those who reject, repudiate, and disown him in this life. Because Christ took away the sin of the world, sin cannot prevent anyone from being fully reconciled with God. The blood of his cross made peace for every creature. Colossians 1, 16 and 20. For in the Son is all created, that in the heavens and that on the earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or lordships or sovereignties or authorities, and through him to reconcile all to him, making peace through the blood of his cross, through him whether those on the earth or those in the heavens. The same all that is created in the Son is the same all that will be reconciled to God because peace has been made through the blood of his cross. The lie of the adversary and the offense of Adam resulted in death for all. The faith and obedience of Christ will result in justification and life for the same all. Romans 4.25 Jesus was given up because of our offenses and was roused because of our justifying. Life and justification will be fully realized by all when death, including the second death, is no more. 
1 Corinthians 15, 26. The last enemy is being abolished, death. 1 Corinthians 15, 54 through 55. Swallowed up was death by victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? All three aspects of death will be abolished for all. The process of dying, the death events, and the death state. Then, only immortal and incorruptible life will remain, and God will be all in all. Is that not the best news that you've ever heard? That God, through his son's death and resurrection, saved you 2,000 years ago. He saved the whole world. He saved me. He saved you and all of your loved ones, whether they believed in this life or not. Now, God is at peace with us through the death and resurrection of Christ. And if you are not at peace with him, he calls to you to be conciliated to him to enjoy that full reconciliation. And that relationship that will be the best relationship that you'll ever have in your entire life. Your relationship with your Heavenly Father. Now many in Orthodox Christianity fight against the fact that God saved us through Jesus 2,000 years ago. And part of their denial of this terrific truth is that they believe in everlasting or eternal torment or everlasting annihilation. But those false ideas are based on horrible mistranslations in most popular Bibles of the Greek word ion and ionios. And when we understand that the judgment that God brings is limited in duration, it is not everlasting or eternal, that can change our entire outlook in understanding that even God's judgments, even his severest judgments, even judgment by death in the lake of fire, will not prevent God from being all in all. So I recommend to you this next video that will hopefully clear up in your mind the misunderstandings of everlasting torment, eternal annihilation, and other false expressions in Orthodox Christianity based on horrible Bible mistranslations. Thank you.